Welcome to the Captain's Lounge Studios. I'm joined today at the table by Brett Batterman, who is renowned as being one of the best sound engineers in all of Colorado. Brett, welcome to the table. Ah, thanks for having me. I'm glad you could be here for a rational recording because this is the first time I've actually had a chance to sit down with a real live professional sound recordist. I have muddled around in this at the theatre and at home, mm -hmm. but you do it for a living. First of all, why don't you just give us a quick introduction of whom you are and what you've been involved with. Well, uh, I was born and raised in California, um, got my college degree there, um, have been in music all throughout my academic career starting in fourth grade and then up through high school and college, uh, being in the choir and the jazz band, so a strong musical background and love of music uh, for my whole life. And then once I realized that you, know, you could make money and go and start a livelihood in this, uh, I began in radio. Uh, doing production and promotion, um, working at the college radio station, but then at the local Clear Channel cluster at the time, um, and then worked my way all the way up to being an on-air talent and uh, doing a, quite a lot of production, commercial production, making little zips and things um, to stick on the radio. Um, after that, uh, after I finished college, I decided um, this was something I wanted to do full-time, um, but wasn't really up to speed on most of the audio engineering uh, knowledge that I needed. So I went to school in Phoenix, Arizona for a year just to get up to speed to what I thought would be proficiency to start my career. Um, once I finished school there, I went to New York City and started working at Searsound, uh, the oldest recording studio in New York City. Uh, worked there for a while, but then as is typical in the studio game, um, you end up moving on rather quickly. So I started just venturing around, doing more audio engineering. I was a producer for a radio station at Kohler Goldwater Hospital on Roosevelt Island, um, and then started picking up gigs doing live production sound for Broadway shows. So th things like Alter Boys and Naked Boys Singing, um, Evil Dead the Musical, and so on. Uh, that must have been fascinating, sort of moving from a hospital to Broadway. Yeah. Um, I what mean, a difference. Quite a different environment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and the hospital is a really interesting time in my career because I was a part of therapeutic recreation. Um, these are permanent patients slash residents who live in the hospital, mm -hmm. whether they have, you know, whatever medical issue may ail them, they are living there now. And so as a part of this therapeutic recreation, they would have their own show on the radio. And then I would be the producer for that show. So they're selecting the music, doing the air breaks, and I'm doing the equipment and the pressing play on the music and things like That's that. That's interesting, because in my childhood, I spent rather too much time in hospital, and British hospitals used to do exactly the same thing. Yeah. Well, and it's a good way to, you know, kind of disconnect from what's ailing you at the moment. Um, music is a wonderful sound right. and healing and uh, yeah I mean I, I made some really wonderful friends and colleagues there uh, it was a bit it was not quite the sort for me um, you know I'm a little I'm probably just too sensitive to work at a hospital that's intense like that it was a bit, yes it was like one flew over the cuckoo's nest with large wards and um, aggressive patients and residents. Be careful, um, I played Mr. Ruckley in One Flew Over oh, the Cuckoo's okay. Nest. okay, well, you know, I played Nurse Ratched earlier, too. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but, that, but part of it was also that, um, you know, being a deep and sensitive person, creative, um, it was a time to do some service and, right. and, you know, extend my heart to people who are in a low place. So, and, and help to uplift them. You know, music is for the upliftment of mankind. Mm -hmm. And we would do our best to help bring others to right. that place. So, you're in New York, uh, you, you've done your work at the hospital, you, you work Broadway. You also worked off Broadway as well, didn't you? Yes, um, eventually, you know, you're making connections. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't particularly happy at the hospital. Um, it was paying the bills, but I wanted to kind of move on. So I was taking freelance gigs at, you know, every place under the sun that would need a gig, or that I had a gig. Um, and eventually I ended up being the full-time sound engineer at the Zipper Theater, which was an off-off Broadway theater that did a lot of, gosh, everything. They did many runs of Jacques Brel. Uh, they did um, Margaret Cho's Sensuous Woman was a show that I worked on, which is mm -hmm. a burlesque show. Um, lots of local burlesques, including Murray Hill. Hey, Murray. Um, yeah, uh, all kinds of wonderful New York types. Um, and the real, like, freaky crowd. Right. I, I, lo I, I love them. They're my people. So <laughs> when, I was, when I was involved heavily in the theater, I always wanted to do Jacques Brel. Yes. Alive and well and living in Paris, because mm -hmm. that has got some of the most incredible songs in it uh -huh. that, that you ever hear in a musical. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. Really, they're absolutely incredible. Okay, so you're in New York, but now you're in Colorado in person. Mm. Yes. 
what made you leave New York? Or was it just getting... Because when we were talking before the show, you, you mentioned hotels. Yes. And what a pain in the <laughs> proverbial uh -huh. they are. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I ended up moving to Washington, D.C. Uh, with my then wife. Um, and we, uh, I, I started working in hotels for Presentation Services Audiovisual, which is mm -hmm. a very large company that's in many, many hotels all over the world. And I was working at the Willard Intercontinental, which is uh, the hotel right down the street from the White House. It's on Pennsylvania Avenue. Oh, okay. Um, and it's just a completely different beast. You know, you're doing hotel events. I was wearing a suit to work every day um, while also doing large AV setups, setting up speakers and projector mm -hmm. screens and taping down cables, all while wearing a suit and trying to mingle with... I mean, I met the everybody at that hotel. I met the president. I, I met Al Franken. You know, uh, Bob Weir and Mickey Hart from nice. the Grateful Dead. Yeah, I mean, and so on. I met the entire cabinet under uh, George W. Bush. Right. Um, I was there for Obama's inaugural when everybody was losing their minds. Um, yeah. yeah. Like that must have been a fun one to do. It was intense. Yeah, that was I can that was a real like I met a historical place. Yes. Good time. So. Um, yeah, and, I, and of course we won't mention the fact that there's a rumor that the 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 battle hymn was actually written there. Yes, but um, we won't we won't talk about uh, okay. that. Okay, <laughs> good, good. Because <laughs> it was a rumor. Uh huh. Where did I hear the rumor from? Oh, that's I right. Think it was me. You. Yeah, that's right. I started the rumor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after my old friend Hunter. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, when you're working uh, Broadway or, or sort of like any theatre backstage. Never any carpeting. It's always normally concrete floors or lino right. floors or whatever. Yeah, right. Much easier to move stuff around. But as soon as you hit the hotels, yeah. you're dealing with, you know, plush carpeting. Yeah, nice carpet. That must have been a pain. It is a pain. Um, well, and it just ramps up the, the labor so much more. You mm -hmm. know, you're pushing these giant, we call them Cadillacs, just large oh, okay. black boxes on, cast, on large caster wheels. Yeah, I've seen them. Mm -hmm, and they're full of a thousand pounds of who knows what. Um, and... Yeah, just getting them around, it's so much more labor. I, I, yes. can't, I really have to underline that part because some people think like, oh, you just sit at the console the whole time during the program. And it's like, no, no, that's the easy part of the show. The hard part is pushing all this stuff around, getting it on and off a truck. That's right. Putting, getting it into a lift and hanging it from the ceiling, you know, and from yep. the truss and everything. So it's a lot, it was a real grind. Um, it was quite a lot of labor. I can um, imagine. And, and it's, it's very difficult to gain efficiencies mm -hmm. because you are you can't have an install situation. You are constantly turning over setups. You know, ah, okay. raising and lowering new screens. There's the whole rental component of right. like this screen has to go to Vegas now, so we have to get this other screen and these other oh, projectors and so on. So yeah, it's a logistical a logistical headache. nightmare. Yeah, yeah. And the staff. Luckily, we have staff to take care of that, but the labor is what I was doing. Yes, um, and that's. The clients are very demanding, be as they should be, because the price is exorbitant. Oh, um, I can imagine. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a soak, if you ask me. But, I mean, that's the way you do it. If you want to do an event in a hotel, you're going to get yeah. soaked. Well, especially a hotel like the Willard. I mean, they, oh, are, yes. they are expecting absolute 100% perfection. Oh, sure. Yeah, well, and that's where everybody who's anybody stays. You know, Kobe Bryant, um, any embassy, the embassy of Iraq, Iran, um, Jack right. Nicholson, you yeah. know, other presidents. Yeah, I served all of those people in that place. Now, meeting those people right. is sort of like a nice little payback. Do you miss that life at all? No. No? I'm not the sort to kowtow to celebrity. Um, I would, you know, there are people that I respect and admire. Mm -hmm. um, I will be nervous around them. Uh, but, you know, average folks are average folks. Right. Um, I, I, uh, I'm coming from a very uh, germane background. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my dad was a farm boy. I grew up in an agricultural town, so I'm, I feel very blue collar oriented in my origination and right. attitudes. So, you're in Washington, D.C., you're sitting down one day at the bar, probably having a nice frothy beer, <laughs> and you're thinking, what am I going to do next? Yeah. What Le happened? Uh, well, I don't know if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., but it's once. Yeah, how did you like it as a tourist? Uh, once was enough. Yeah, exactly. Just like, it was just like yeah. New when I visited New York back okay. in, when was that? That would have been 82. Yeah, once was enough. I know. Did you ride the subway with all the graffiti on it? Like, we never went down in the subway, okay. but we got a Smart. we got a cab from um, uh, which airport did we fly into? LaGuardia mm -hmm. to our hotel, which was right on Central Park. Sweet. And I don't know why the taxi driver did this, but we're driving through one area of New York, and there were burnt-out cars and vans 
along the side of the road. The buildings looked like they were totally unsafe. Mm -hmm. So we get to the hotel, I check into the hotel. I'm with Peter Morn, a very good friend of mine. And, uh, okay, Pete, what should we do? Let's go out and find something to eat. Fine. So the distance from the hotel front door to the, to the, to the, to the uh, end of the sidewalk, where the taxi rank was, was probably about 50 feet. We both got propositioned twice yeah. from the door to the taxi. Yep. I've never been back. Yep. Well, and, and it's such a strange thing because when I was there, I call it the Disneyland time. Yes. Like, in fact, on page six of the New York Post, there was always a picture of some young lady wearing a handkerchief and face down in the gutter completely smashed. And it's like, that is a giant target as far as I could tell. But that was the time it was. Like, that yes. you could just do that and nobody would lay a hand on that it's person amazing, ostensibly. I know, it's, it's a little bit reckless it's in my it's opinion. Amazing, but, um, anyway, but, let's, get, let's get back on subject. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> so I just bring it up because everybody has, many people have a very different impression of D.C. than living there. Mm -hmm. um, I think as a tourist, it's fantastic, and I try to engage all of those tourist activities, whether it's going to the Smithsonian that's free, all of the free stuff, you know. Right. Um, however, the weather is terrible. Um, the people are inconsolable, mm -hmm. um, and it was totally the wrong place for me. Um, you yeah. just didn't, you never felt at home? Absolutely not. Quite right. the opposite. You know, feeling okay. st the stress of like, oh, I don't fit in here, and I don't like it. Right. Um, so I was looking just to transfer with my company, you know, make it easy yep. on myself, keep a job. And so I was looking at everywhere from Vancouver, B uh, British Columbia, Alaska, Hawaii, Because they do a lot of San Diego. They, they do a lot of movie making up there, don't they? Oh, yeah. And TV bet. shows, uh -huh, of course. Sure. Well, and just moving within the AV company was going to be a total, it's, you know, one role to the exact same role at another hotel. Uh, and eventually I, you know, gained traction. Uh, they needed my role here in Denver at the Westin uh, Denver downtown, right by Lanny's Clock Tower. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, on 16th Street Mall. Yep. And so I just negotiated a, a swap and moved on out. And frankly, it was the best decision I ever made. There was quite a lot of hurdles. It, DC is a very expensive place, so it yes. was hard to build the nest egg to rent the truck. Gas was $4 at the time. This was mm -hmm. in 2011. And I, I thought about it, it's like everybody's, oh, it's gonna be so expensive. And it's like, I would give every cent I have, every object I have to get out of here because mm -hmm. it is a quality of life situation. I am burning my life away and hating it. So whatever it takes, man, whatever right. it takes. And I mean, that's like chump change compared to like fleeing your home in the Soviet Union during the war. Oh, absolutely. The whatever. Absolutely. But I, I really resonate with that because it's like, I don't want to be here. You're saying it's, the gas is too expensive. I would pay any amount if a genie popped up and was like, pay me and I'll, get, I'll relocate you. I'll yeah. Like, take it all. Take it all. So, um, so you're now, you're now, yeah, so you're now, now I'm in Colorado. Colorado. Had, yeah. you, had you been here before? I had been here once. Yeah, I came okay. out with a mentor friend of mine, uh, John Chimpf, uh, and he, yeah, just showed me what it was like and how wonderful it was. Nice wide open spaces, outdoors. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But then, of course, being in Denver, so I'm working at the Denver downtown, um, I began doing live sound gigs for Megan Burt, um, who's a Colorado favorite. Mm -hmm. um, and... Yeah, just, you know, as you do in audio engineering circles, music circles, you know, branching out, finding new colleagues and new friends. Eventually, I left the AV game um, and just spent some time, like, kind of gathering myself, applying to new jobs. And eventually, I now where I work is at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Okay. Um, producing their multimedia events and videos. Uh, yeah, and, that, and that's where I've just been so there. So that means I've seen some of your stuff. Uh, I wouldn't doubt it. Um, yeah, and I've been there. This is my 10th year. So I'm okay. just completing my 10th year, and it's fantastic. It's a real bird's nest on the ground job for my field. So. Isn't that a bit of a pain getting to work every morning? Oh, it's not terrible. No, no. no. Um, I mean, I come from California, so traffic there is on a whole other level. Um, right. Yeah, it's an order of magnitude. I've lived in London, so I understand oh, gosh, exactly yeah, what yeah. you're talking about. <laughs> well, at least London has, you know, public transportation. Yes. Um, yeah, in California, it's a little rough. London drivers treat traffic lights like the start of a Formula One race. Mm -hmm. yep. When the lights turn to green, everyone moves at the same time. That's right. Why is it Americans wait until the car in front is at least 10 feet away before they start moving? Well, you got to finish writing your text message. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I should have known Yeah, that. I mean, that's what you do at a red light, right, is bust out your cell phone. Anyway, right, so you're in Denver. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, once I got the job at the at NCAR, um, I moved up to Longmont and, yeah, started working on music here. Um, you know, produced the first album in town. Because uh, you have your own studio right here in yeah. town, don't you? Uh huh. Yeah, I have a recording equipment and been, uh, you know, just 
accumulating equipment and working my way up, uh, perfecting my skills, um, and yeah, helping the local people fulfill their recording needs. Okay. Was this the first time you've actually built your own studio? Um, you probably sort of had one as a kid, because I know you were sort of interested in, in uh -huh. sound even way back then. But. Sure. Um, well, I think building a studio probably goes into uh, changing the building. Mm -hmm. You know, making the building how it needs to be to function oh. as a place to facilitate sessions. Um, I definitely, I have done that before in the first studio I worked at in Stockton, California. Uh, we fabricated tons of uh, isolation rooms, and mm -hmm. then, you know, doing everything from floating the floor, disconnecting the walls, decoupling the walls, putting DAP and all of that caulking yep. everywhere. You know, to isolate sound, bleed, and things like that. Um, and not only that, but now with so much online content and information, you can really minimize the amount of intrusion you do if you want to do something in your house. Right. You know, so many years have gone by where artists will rent a house and just bring in all the equipment, and they mm -hmm. don't bring in a ton of extra sound dampening or anything. So I try to focus along those same ideas, keeping it functional and minimal, uh, but also able to change between, you know, it's 95% yes. of the time it's just my house. I don't have a session in there. Right. So I, I keep it able to transition between both and then also be very effective and productive as a recording space, you know, no bleed, Absolutely. not a lot of intrusion of outside noise. And Absolutely. Now, I know our producer wants me to talk about this. Hardware and software. Mm -hmm. What sort of uh, microphones do you use, or do you have specific microphones for a specific task? Um, I think that there's specific microphones for specific tasks. Um, it definitely, you must have a mind for what you are going for, mm -hmm. um, what, you, yeah, what you're shooting for, and what it, it will look like and feel like down the road, um, sound like, I suppose. Uh, yeah, the kinds of microphones, I've been leaning more towards tube mics. Um, they are more expensive, but the quality is often, they're just more forgiving. Okay, now, you know. tube mic. Yes. What does that mean? Um, that means that there is a tube, in yeah. The, yeah, a vacuum tube in the microphone, and that functions as the main gain increase oh. in order to provide uh, a line level, usable level, yes. coming out of the microphone. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh -huh. Whereas many microphones, I mean, you st there's a microphones and then there's preamps. Mm -hmm. Many microphones need significant preamplification before they are at a usable level. Tube microphones are often already at that usable line level because that oh. preamplification has largely taken place in the microphone with the tube. Using the tube. Which makes an awful lot of sense, really, when you think about it. Uh huh. Well, and originally it was a no-brainer because then you could troubleshoot problems. Right. You know, like whether it's a buzzing or a hum, you know, any yes. of that kind of stuff, you can trace it to the line, switch a power supply, switch a capsule, whatever yeah. you have to do. Whatever you have to do. Yeah, and get on with business. So, I uh, I had the pleasure of actually going to a recording studio in uh, uh, where are we? Northern Denver. And uh, actually, a couple of people that have come down here, uh, Shuana and uh, Stavros mm -hmm. Cross, uh, they were recording their, their song da down there. Mm -hmm. So I went down to the studio. They wanted me to videotape some of it. And I was astonished because the engineer was sitting at his computer, which I'm sure yep. you do the same thing. And this goes back to what we talked about with uh, Meatloaf and all the rest of it. Sort of like they they'd record a segment, and then they'd play it back, and sort of Stavros would say, well, ca can we take that down a little? And he just went, whoa, 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 da, done. Mm -hmm. And I'm stood there going, I want that software. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I could not believe what you're able to do now. Yep. It was unbelievable. What sort of uh, software do you like using? Um, right now I'm using PreSonus uh, Studio One mm -hmm. as my software. I grew up using Pro Tools. Uh, yeah. But in my opinion, uh, DigiDesign and Avid left a lot of the meat on the table. Mm -hmm. You know, they would make you pay extra for this or that special special function. Yes. Um, and every other software developer has really incorporated those functions largely within the software itself at no extra cost. Right. Um, and PreSonus seems to really be, you know, they, they originally just made that software so that when you bought their hardware interface, you would have a software to get going, yes. recording yourself. Yeah. Um, but it became so popular because it offered all this functionality that these pro softwares, I mean, you can do it in there, but often it is a little bit more of a headache not quite as an intuitive as a modern drag and drop software would be. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean by leaving meat on the table. You know, if you want 
people to buy your product, you must incentivize them, especially when your competition is giving every other thing that you're not giving at, gosh, a third the price, a quarter of the price, right. you know, depending on, admittedly, Pro Tools is still what they would designate as the industry standard, mm -hmm. but I think that that is along the lines of if you work in commercial studios, you will be able to go from studio to studio and know that there's a Pro Tools rig there that you can use as you would use it studio to studio. And that's similar to how there will be a Neumann U87 at every studio. Yep. There will be a whatever Neve pre, whatever there is, a LA-2A at every studio that you're like, okay, this is a common tool. I can use it the way right. that I always use it. Mm -hmm. When we were doing um, The Elephant Man at the, uh, the theater, oh, a long time ago, that must have been when? Oh my goodness, 93, 94, yeah. something like that. Anyway, I was asked to do all the sound for the show. And there's one bit where, um, I can't remember the character's name now, but the Indian stands right at the front of the stage and he's, and he's thinking. And they did not want him to, to say the lines, they wanted me to have him thinking the lines. So I wanted to add a little bit of echo and a little bit of, you know, this and that and the other. And I found this tool called Cool, uh, cool Edit. Yeah. I know cool edit. What a great program that was, oh. only to be totally ruined by Adobe, but yeah. we won't go into that. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a great little program that was when you mm -hmm. consider the, when it was written. Yeah. They were really doing some good stuff back then. Oh, absolutely. Especially in the nonlinear editing yes. format, which required so much horsepower that really wasn't necessary uh, from these larger, you know, DigiDesign. Right. They would come out with an interface that had you had to have a PCI card or something to connect to. Um, quite a bit of horsepower to run that stuff. Yeah. Whereas Cool Edit Pro just worked. It just yeah, worked. Yeah, I, I, that's what I started in radio production using was Cool Edit Pro and then transitioned okay. to Odo, Adobe Audition. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of interesting because uh, rendering was always a little bit slow. A bit, yeah. Until I, I was on a 386. I mean, that shows how long yeah, ago we're, we're going back. And a friend of mine lent me the math co coprocessor. Okay. Plug that little baby in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instant. Well, well, unbelievable. And what was nice about the render is that DigiDesign will drop. Like, you're halfway through a bounce or a render, and it'll say, oh, DAE error, we've experienced an error, and Cool Edit Pro never did that. Never did that? No, never did that. Which is, this is what I mean by leaving meat on the table, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and in school, they would, we would always go back and forth, like, why is it like this? And our teacher would bring up the picture of the guy whose job it was to fit to, like, address customer concerns. Yes. Yeah, and it's like, it's this guy's fault, because he's not responding to the industry's demands, so... You have to give the customers what they need. Yeah, exactly. You really do. Well, and be responsive. And be responsive you know, to them. Otherwise, you're just going to take it on the chin and everyone's going to hate you. That's Not right. Everyone, and someone, and someone, else will, someone else will do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and this is what the real true story of what we just, I just said is, uh, yeah, PreSonus, I've never, ever had a session crash. Mm -hmm. I've never had errors. I can bounce without fail. I've never had a bounce fail, right? Um, and I cannot say the same for DigiDesign. I remember having to do version updates and just p taking a whole Saturday and be like, well, this is how I'm going to fart around with DigiDesign all day. Oh, my because, goodness. Because, yeah, and like all that time I've gotten back, I can go for a hike or yes. do, what I, do whatever I want, read a book. Absolutely. Listen to more music, maybe work on another session. Absolutely. <laughs> Would you rather be working in the environment that you have built for yourself where you can do everything basically sitting down on a computer screen? Or would you rather be back in the 70s and the 80s where you had to be so innovative in creating what the artists were looking for? Um, I remember seeing a documentary, uh, Pink Floyd, uh, actually doing uh, Dark Side of the Moon. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely incredible because, you know, they're running tape all the way around yeah. the studio to get long echoes. Yeah, the big tape loops. Mm -hmm. and, and what they were doing was unbelievable. Yeah, and then new. right at the end, this is before the automatic uh, yeah. mixing. Automation. There's five of them. Yeah. All there, mixing together. Yep. I mean, truly believe. So where would you have been happiest? Um, you know, I'm a pretty amiable guy. Um, I also have come to realize that I don't f sit well in the studio life, and I just mean being in a dark room 14 hours a day for months at a stretch. Um, I like to get out. Mm -hmm. um, to that question, I would say that both, both scenarios have their advantages and disadvantages. At the time, you wouldn't really know the difference. Um, I think in t talking to you earlier, I mentioned that I would really appreciate the professionalism of 
old sessions and mm -hmm. just, you know, back in the day they used to wear lab coats. Yes. The engineers would wear, I mean, and that's how serious they took it. Uh, but then, you know, moving forward to, you know, some of my mentors like Bill Schnee and Al Schmidt, um, they, they emphasize so much that you need to know the tools and know how to use them to facilitate the mission. Right. And I think that that, that idea and culture remains the same today as it does back in the day, you know, in the 60s and 70s when mm -hmm. you're trying to push the envelope. Um, you know, everybody's working to the same masthead and the same mission, um, similar to a marriage or a band, you know, a bond. Right. And if you can put that first, then everything else seems to fall into place, you know. Um, similar to acting in the method, mm -hmm. uh, you do as much research as you possibly can, and then when the moment comes, you release and let things happen. Um, knowing that like, yeah, my skills are all there, I can deliver, we're gonna deliver now, and if anything happens, if there's a problem, I can take care of it, you know? And that builds confidence to ramp up your own productions. Right. Ramp up your own skills, your own productions, and eventually have satisfaction that you didn't even think was possible in your, in your, in your gigs, in your deliveries, yeah. Brett, thank you so much for coming into the studio this morning, and it's good to see you here in the Captain's Lounge. And hopefully we'll be able to get you back in the future and we can investigate some other interesting things from our talk that we had before sitting down to do this. Yeah, fantastic. Because we, we sort of went in all different directions. Yeah. It was wonderful. <laughs> sure did. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Nigel. Great You're very, here. very welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in for another uh, rational, what are we going to call this show? Rational recording. Why not? I've never done one of those before. Everybody, thank you very much for watching. I'm Nigel Abes, your host, signing off from the Captain's Lounge studio. And once again, Brett, thank you so much for coming in today. Thanks for having me. Goodbye.